good morning, Crossroads, and everyone who's live streaming from abroad. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for tuning in and joining us for worship and a great message by our Pastor Paul on the parables of Jesus. Before we go into the service, I have a few announcements for us. Uh, the first one really is our mission month in August is coming up. You might have heard the announcement last week. You might have seen our uh, messages through uh, other channels as well. Uh, August is going to be mission month and we have some great activities planned for us. The first week, next week, we're going to start off with some amazing Serve the City projects in the wider Amsterdam, Amstelveen area and what we call the Prison Blessing. Uh, prison Blessing is a really practical way to do something for the prisoners uh, through our prison ministry that we're serving uh, by donating some clothes, uh, buying them some shoes, uh, maybe some trousers that are still in good condition that you don't need anymore. Guys, clean out your closet and donate this. It's such a practical way to bless these guys. Uh, then in week two, we're going to do the Pantry Purge Challenge. Um, maybe in Corona times you've stocked up on some things you no longer need. Uh, maybe you just like to bless people uh, with some food items and you can do this through this challenge. So we invite you, uh, take your kids along, take your family along, clean out the pantry cabinets, clean out what you don't need, maybe put something extra in there and help us donate it to the food bank. The details of these events and the ones in the following weeks can be found on our website. So sign up and uh, let us know that you're joining. Okay, then thirdly, we are going to start our Alpha course again in the fall. Uh, the team has been meeting together, praying together, making preparations to start this course. If you're a new believer, if you're curious about God, who God is, and why we worship this Jesus, then this course is for you. Um, through 10 sessions and by having a meal together in a short segment of uh, a teaching, we're going to explore what the Christian faith is. Uh, so we hope you can sign up for that. For the Crossroaders who already know Jesus, I would just like to challenge you for this month. Maybe pray and think about who you can invite to join this course. Who can you invite uh, that might want to discover more about this Jesus that you know and love? The Alpha Course is a great way to start for them. So we hope you will be able to invite them to that and that you will sign up for that. Lastly, we want to thank you for blessing us financially. Supporting our church with your resources makes this possible. It makes it possible for us to keep the lights on and to keep uh, producing these services and continue our ministries on a daily basis. So we want to thank you for your faithful support. If you don't uh, support Crossroads yet, you can do so via uh, giving. You can do that via a bank transfer. There's a ticky uh, in the screen that you can use. And if you'd like more information about that, please look at our website. There is all the details there. Thank you for that in advance. All right, that's it for the announcements. It's time for the community news. Firstly, I would just like to highlight our seasonal groups that have ended for the summer. Uh, you know, we've had a cooking group with Jennifer. We've had a couples group led by Carolyn Ross and some others as well. And we're just so grateful to you as uh, leaders and to those who have participated. I think it's been a very fun, enriching experience, and we have been really blessed to be able to do this in these times. And I have good news. In the fall, we have a couple of great groups lined up. Uh, Jennifer is going to continue her cooking group. I hear there's, uh, there might be a cooking group uh, even for the month of December to prepare for Christmas cooking. How sweet is that? Um, um, Carolyn Ross is going to continue her uh, marriage group again, restart it. And there, there's some other groups in the pipeline as well. So we hope, uh, just keep an eye on our website. We hope you'll be able to continue to join those. And just send us your ideas. If you feel like you want to lead a group or if you feel like you have an interesting theme that we should cover, uh, we're open to suggestions. So just email me and we'll, uh, we'll work it out. Secondly, uh, our life group season, uh, normally it kind of uh, has a natural break in the summer. This summer, however, we're asking the life group leaders and the life groups to continue meeting. As you know, we have some interesting activities lined up in Mission Month. And I'd just like to already mention that 
for the first Sunday of September. We're going to do a big life group launch, and we have a couple of great uh, new things that we're starting up and developing uh, that's going to be a blessing. And if you're looking for a life group, if you're interested to join one, you can. Uh, just shoot a message to Lydia at xrds.nl, and we'll try to uh, get you connected to a life group. So we're excited for that. Uh, lastly, I want to congratulate everyone who's celebrating their birthday this week. Uh, yay, even though people might be on holiday usually, hopefully they're around now. Uh, so I hope you can enjoy it with your family. And if you know anybody, uh, if you recognize any names on the screen, please just uh, send them a nice message, send them a card, send them a hug, and uh, wish them a great week. Uh, that's it for the announcements and the community news. Now let's worship together. Good morning, Crossroads. I want to read a small part from Ephesians. It says, Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give it Jesus. 
This story is taken from the Bible at Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 32. Dit verhaal komt uit de Bijbel in Lucas hoofdstuk 12, vers 13 tot 32. Once Jesus was speaking in front of a large crowd of thousands of people. Op een dag sprak Jezus tegen een grote menigte van duizenden mensen. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Iemand uit de menigte zei tegen hem, Meester, zeg tegen mijn broer dat hij de erfenis met mij moet delen. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Maar Jezus antwoordde, wie heeft mij als rechter of bemiddelaar over jullie aangesteld? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Hij zei tegen hen, pas op, hoed je voor iedere vorm van hebzucht. Want iemands leven hangt niet af van zijn bezittingen, zelfs niet wanneer hij die in overvloed heeft. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. En hij vertelde hun de volgende gelijkenis. Het landgoed van een rijke man had veel opgebracht. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. En daarom vroeg hij zich af, wat moet ik doen? Ik heb geen ruimte om mijn voorraden op te slaan. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Toen zei hij bij zichzelf, wat ik zal doen is dit. Ik breek mijn schuren af en bouw grotere, waar ik al mijn graan en goederen kan opslaan. En I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. En dan zal ik tegen mezelf zeggen, je hebt veel goederen in voorraad, genoeg voor vele jaren. Neem rust, eet, drink en vermaak je. God zei to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Maar God zei tegen hem, dwaas, nog deze nacht zal je leven van je woorden teruggevorderd. Voor wie zijn dan de schatten die je hebt opgeslagen? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Zo vergaat het iemand die schatten verzamelt voor zichzelf en niet rijk is bij God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Hij zei tegen zijn leerlingen, om deze reden zeg ik tegen jullie, maak je geen zorgen over jezelf en over wat je zult eten, nog over je lichaam en over wat je zult aantrekken. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Want het leven is meer dan voedsel, en het lichaam meer dan kleding. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Kijk naar de raven. Ze zaaien niet en oogsten niet. Ze hebben geen voorraadkamer en geen schuur. Het is God die ze voedt. Hoeveel meer zijn jullie niet waard dan vogels? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Wie van jullie kan door zich zorgen te maken één L aan zijn levensduur toevoegen? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Als jullie dus zelfs het geringste al niet kunnen, waarom maken jullie je dan zorgen over de rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was stressed like one of these. Kijk naar de lelies, kijk hoe ze groeien. Ze werken niet en weven niet. Ik zeg jullie, zelfs Salomon ging in al zijn luister niet gekleed als een van hen. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? Als God het groen dat vandaag nog op het veld staat en morgen in de oven gegooid wordt, al met zoveel zorg kleedt. Met hoeveel meer zorg zal hij jullie dan niet kleden, kleine gelovigen? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. Ook jullie moeten niet nadenken over wat je zult eten en wat je zult drinken. En jullie moeten je niet door zorgen laten kennen. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Zoek liever zijn koninkrijk en die andere dingen zullen je erbij gegeven worden. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Vrees niet, kleine kudde, want jullie vader heeft jullie het koninkrijk willen schenken. Good morning, friends. Now, we've been looking at some of the stories, uh, parables, uh, that Jesus told. 
All in all, Jesus told about 42 parables, but we've only picked four of them to look at during the sermon series. Four, uh, and I chose them specifically because uh, I believe four that teaches us a powerful and transformative message, four that impacted the world and can radically change how we see ourselves, God, and the world around us. Now, in today's story, we learn about riches and how to understand the things that God blesses us with. Uh, it is a parable about potentially missing the point. It's a parable about how to live wisely. Let us read the story. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. But Jesus said to him, Who, who said I should judge or decide between you? Then Jesus said to them, be careful and guard against all kinds of greed. Life is not measured by how much one owns. Verse 15. Then Jesus told this story. There was a rich man who had some land which grew a good crop. And he thought to himself, what will I do? I have no place to keep all my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and other goods. Then I can say to myself, I have enough good things stored to last for many, many years. Rest, eat, drink, and enjoy life. Verse 20 but God said to him, foolish man, tonight your life will be taken from you. So who will get those things then you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for those who store up things for themselves and are not rich toward God. And then let's skip and read from, uh, or let's read from verses 22 to 34. Jesus said this to his followers. So note that now Jesus is talking to his disciples and not the crowd so much. So I tell you, don't worry about the food you need to live or about the clothes you need for your body. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothes. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest. They don't have storerooms and barns, but God feeds them. And you are worth much more than birds. You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. If you cannot even do the little things, then why worry about the big things? Consider how the lilies grow. They don't work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you that even Solomon, with his riches, was not dressed as beautifully as one of these flowers. God clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today, but tomorrow is thrown into the fire. So, how much more will God clothe you? Don't have so little faith, verse 29. Don't always think about what you will eat or what you will drink. And don't keep worrying. All the people in the world are trying to get these things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek God's kingdom and all your other needs will be met as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, verse 33, and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen.
What a powerful, powerful story. In this parable, we learn something about the relationship that God wants us to have with our possessions. Now, just a reminder, friends, again, uh, we prepared some life group discussion questions and daily readings for, the, for this week ahead. Uh, so please feel free to uh, download it and to engage with the material. And my hope is that it will help you to understand this, uh, this uh, parable and that God will use it to speak to you. Right. So Jesus here in Luke 12 is in Judea. And let's just remind ourselves of the bigger picture, the bigger context. Sorry, I'm going to cough. <coughs> let's remind ourselves of the bigger picture and context here is that he is making his way now down towards uh, Jerusalem where he will be crucified. And um, whenever at this stage he is in Jerusalem, uh, uh, in Judea, large crowds of people would gather. So his ministry was really becoming popular. People really all across that part of the country wanted to hear what he was teaching. So he's busy preaching to a large crowd. All of a sudden, he's interrupted. In the middle of his sermon, this guy just shouts out, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. I mean, this is out of the blue uh, because Jesus wasn't preaching about this topic. Uh, this was disconnected from what was going on, from what Jesus was saying. And this guy just shouts out this question. Obviously, this has been on this guy's mind, and he feels somehow that his brother has ripped him off in a terrible way um, concerning the inheritance. Now, the law of Moses was fairly clear uh, about inheritance. Only the boys would inherit. Girls did not inherit. But the sons had, of course, to look after their sisters until they got married. And furthermore, the oldest brother uh, would always inherit a double portion. So let's say for argument's sake, if there were four brothers, the estate would have been divided into five and the oldest son would get two portions. But now you can imagine that there would always possibly be uh, some fairness issues about how things would be divided up. So, I mean, uh, how would you divide the land would become the question. So let's say you get 10 acres, but which 10 acres would your older brother give you? The rocky part of the land, which was useless? And so this man must have felt that his brother has not acted fairly uh, towards him and uh, he was cheated in some way. And so he blurts out this question, tell uh, my brother to share the inheritance with me in a fair way. Jesus replies in verse 14, he says, who said that I should judge or decide between you? In other words, he said, hey man, listen, this has got nothing to do with me. There must be, I'm sure, some lawyers in your town or some elders. Go and talk to them. I don't know you. I don't know the, situ the situation you find yourself in. So how must I make a decision on this? Is kind of the thing that Jesus was saying to this man. But then Jesus follows that up. And I think because he must have sensed what was going on in the hearts, of, um, in the man's heart, but possibly also, I think, in the heart of the crowd that had gathered. He follows it up with this, verse 15. Jesus says to them, Be careful, in big bold letters, be careful and guard against all kinds of greed. Life is not measured by how much one owns. My friends, this is such an important verse, and it is worth memorizing. I mean, he says, Jesus is saying, take care, watch out, be on your guard against greed. In fact, I want to read it for you from a different translation. I'm going to read it from the NIV translation, that same verse, Luke 12, verse 15, worth memorizing. Here it is. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Again, Jesus is saying uh, in big, bold letters, my friends, people, watch out. Be on your guard against greed because it creeps into your heart so easily, so quickly. Now, the term greed means a consuming desire to have more. 
it has the nuance of a, a, gra a grabbing, a grasping for more, a lust to acquire, to have more stuff. Jesus knows us, and he knows that we all wrestle with this. I mean, why do you think even in the time of Moses, God had to give the law, do not covet? Even a freed people now here, traveling in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, with one would think very little possessions, even they struggled with this. I mean, you can imagine, they would set up their tents in the desert, and they would go, oh man, wow, look at this tent. Why is your tent much nicer than mine? I wish I had a tent like yours. Yours is way better than mine. I've got to get a tent like that. And he tells this parable, and in this, uh, he uses the word, with the Greek word, pleonexia. Pleonexia means an insatiable desire for more, greed. It is, in fact, the very opposite of the contentment that accompanies true godliness uh, that we are taught in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. It is important that you listen and hear me now, Jesus is saying, why was it important for Jesus to say that? Uh, and that for those listening to him to be reminded of this? Well, my friends, because the culture, all, the culture all around us is telling us that in fact our life does consist in the abundance of possessions. And that you should not be content with what you have because you need this, and to be fully, authentically human, um, that you would finally be happy if you could just have this one more thing. Then you'll be complete. Just an important side note here very quickly. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that we will miss the point of this parable if we see greed as an issue of amount and not attitude. It is about attitude, not amount. My friends, the poorest of poor can be greedy because the wrong attitude. The richest of rich, or the most rich person in the world, can have um, no, no greed in his or her heart because of attitude. So they might have a lot, but they're not greedy. But the danger, of course, is, my friends, that possessions um, often arouse within us this, this desire for more. My friends, you and I have been nurtured in a society that seduces us with the promise of affluence and measures worth uh, on the basis of possessions and positions. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with professional success and financial security or personal prosperity. But as the Lord has told us in Luke 14, verse 33, we cannot be both his disciples um, and love our possessions. We have to say goodbye to our possessions to follow him fully in the way that we should. The Lord once told the group, Jesus once told the group of Pharisees described as people who loved money in Luke 16, verse 15, that what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. I mean, th 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 those are some powerful words, friends. Now, I, undoubtedly, uh, we as a society value the fruits of being well-to-do and successful. And Jesus has a very painful way of probing in telling this story, of probing our central nervous system, you know. And, and the thing is, we are meant to examine, as we read the story, we are meant to examine our hearts and ask, what is it that uh, I aspire to in life? What has my heart? In the parable of the rich fool found in Luke 12, 13 to 21, he forces all of us uh, to face some searching questions about ourselves. The real spiritual reason, I think, why Jesus is making such a powerful point about this is the fact that greed and the drive for more stuff and accumulating more things can become and can, can get closely connected to idolatry in our lives, as we read in Colossians 3 verse 5. And in this parable, we are reminded of this inescapable truth that God alone is the source of life. God alone controls life. God alone gives life. So we're meant to ask this question as we read the story, friends. What do you aspire to in life? What do you aspire to do with your life? Let me mention just a couple of areas, just two, where I think we might struggle with pleonexia, greed, as I look at my own life as well. Firstly, I think we struggle with pleonexia in the area of the desire for more the desire to accumulate more stuff. Perhaps for you it's shoes, I don't know. 
Let me tell you, don't laugh at me. For me, it's torches. I love a good torch. And I just want more. I think I currently own close, if not more, than 10 different torches. What happens is I get a torch, then I see another model, and this one has a thousand lumens, and I've just got to have it. And every time I go into the bush, I think to myself, Paul, you know what you really need? You need a new torch. <laughs> but really, how many torches do you need? You know, what is it for you? For me, it's torches. A Jewish rabbi teaching about Pleonexia said that whoever craves wealth is like a man who drinks seawater. The more he drinks, the more he increases his thirst until he will drink himself to death. Drinking seawater doesn't satisfy. It just makes you thirstier. And that's the problem with possessions and greed. Drinking the wrong stuff is what Jesus is saying in the story. You're drinking the wrong stuff. Secondly, where we struggle with pleonexia um, is the fear of uh, giving things away, letting go, giving things up. You know, I already have things, but I'm afraid of letting them go. You know, somehow there's this fear that what if I give this up and I need it later? Sometimes it's money, not necessarily always, but sometimes it's money. You know, I have more than I need and I could give more to mission or people in need, but I'm afraid to give it up because what if I need it someday? You know, sometimes it is uh, stuff and not wanting to let go uh, of them. And there's an English word for it. It's called hoarding. You know, holding on to things for fear of what happens if I give it away and I need it later. You never know, I might just need it, so I better accumulate the stuff. Now, in this parable, Jesus is probing our hearts and exposing something that we all struggle with. Pleonexia, greed. But what I love about the story is that Jesus then presents us with an alternative a different way of seeing our possessions, a different way of living, a different way of going about things. Let me read it for us again. Jesus then said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the birds. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, well, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all these things. And your father knows. He knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. What beautiful, beautiful teaching from Jesus. Luke makes it very clear, and we must understand this, that at, at this part of the story, uh, Luke makes it very clear uh, that Jesus is now speaking to his disciples. He's not addressing the crowd anymore, but to his followers, those who believe in him and those who f f uh, follow him. And I think in doing that, there's an implication here that worrying could potentially be one of the things that we really struggle with as Christ followers. And the reason it's not hard to discover, because the to be being a disciple and a follower of Jesus is demanding. The obey to call is to trust Christ completely and to surrender completely to him. You know, so the implications of disobedience is, um, I have to say goodbye to all my possessions. 
And as the, uh, just like those early disciples did. You know, will the Lord really meet my needs? And even for us today, the call to surrender all still rings true. So my head assures me, yes, God will provide. I know this. I've read it in the Bible. But my heart is not always quite so sure, quite so certain. So I want to talk a little bit about worrying. Worry, being anxious. Will God really look after me? Will God really provide? Proverbs 12 verse 25 says, An anxious heart weighs a man down. Oh my goodness, how true that is. Let me tell you, I have a PhD in anxiety. Anxiety steals our emotional peace. Worry is, is not... Um, the appropriate concern for life's responsibilities. No, worry is rather the undue care, the exaggerated concern. The people to whom the Lord's speaking uh, know to his disciples now, they know uh, the scramble for life's, necess for life's necessities, how difficult life can be. I mean, life was hard in biblical Palestine. You know, and the needs, for their needs, weren't just going to fall into uh, their laps accidentally, nor was there a government who was going to look after them. So they had to work to provide. And so Jesus is not calling here in the story for thoughtlessness or the absence of appropriate concern for life's uh, stuff that we need in life. The sense of what Jesus is talking about here, what he's saying here about not worrying, is actually beautifully illustrated in the story of Mary and Martha. Martha, we read, was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made in Luke 10 verse 40. She was totally unable, because she was so distracted worrying about life's things, that she was unable to enjoy the Lord's presence with her here now, because her mind was divided by other responsibilities. The Greek word for worry literally means to divide your mind. The Latin word uh, for our English word anxiety is angera, to choke, to be in distress. So Jesus' words here are Martha, Martha in that story. You are worried and upset about many things. Your mind is divided, and this, and this divided mind is choking you. Your worrying is choking, choking you. Anxiety, worry, is the emotional distraction and distress that comes from allowing the things of this world, the unknowns of this life, to absorb and control us and to choke life out of us. So telling us not to worry isn't very helpful, right? I mean, people who tell us uh, not to worry either seem unrealistic, uninformed, or just patronizing. And this is what I love about this story. So Jesus doesn't just tell us not to worry uh, and then just leave us. Instead, in the story, he forces us to think about why we are not to worry. So pointing to God's care. And in verses 22 to 24, if we break this passage up, 22 to 24, firstly, Jesus says to us, he's saying, listen, that worry is foolishness. It doesn't make sense. It is making the same mistake as the rich fool who believed that his life consisted of his possessions. But life is more than food and clothes. And God has promised that he will take care of us, much more so than he does for the creatures uh, all around us. To worry is foolishness because it's foolishly to forget, firstly, who we are, God's valued children, and secondly, who He is, a loving Heavenly Father who will not let us go without. Secondly, then, in verses 25 to 28, Jesus says, to worry is pointless, it's futile, because the irony is that worry can shorten life, but it can't lengthen it. And God who gives beauty to the fields will not strip us bare. Anxiety and worry denies, was what Jesus is saying, denies the care of God and all to no avail, to no effect. So the alternative then is not to care less, but to be more trustful. And honestly, a little bit of reflection uh, helps us to recognize that most worry is about things that can't be changed anyway, the past, things that can't be controlled now, the present, or things that might not even happen, the future. How much more better isn't it then 
to entrust our lives, our now, to God, is what Jesus is saying. And then thirdly, in verses 29 to 31, Jesus is saying, to worry is to be actually without faith, to live without faith. Worry is the product of an inadequate understanding of who God is, who our Heavenly Father really is. He is the one who knows, cares, and acts on our behalf. The way we look at God determines the way we look at our possessions, at life, and how we approach life and what we aspire to. And this will ultimately determine, um, determine what we worry about. Our great need is actually to worry about the right thing. And what is that? Seeking the kingdom of God. And Jesus is kind of saying here that, um, you know, it's okay to have concern, but be concerned about the right thing. Replace concern about secondary inconsequential things with concern for the primary, most important thing, the kingdom of God. Only God's kingdom, Jesus is saying, is worthy of our ultimate concern. So in summary then, this rich farmer made two fundamental errors when it comes to his possessions. First, he never saw beyond this world. My friends, for a Christian, for a follower of Christ, our mortality is no longer something to be feared. Instead, it is a reality to be taken seriously. In what ways are you planning for and living for the time when this world's material possessions will no longer matter, in other words, eternity? That is the question Jesus is wanting us to ask here when confronted with the story. In this parable, Jesus is saying, the time to prepare for eternity is now. Don't waste energy on preparing or worrying about stuff that has no eternal value. And the way you store up treasure for yourself is by seeking God's kingdom, His righteousness. That is living wisely. That's not missing the point of life. That's being smart. Storing up treasure in heaven, not here on earth, because it doesn't last. It gets stolen. It rusts. You can't take it with you when you die. The farmer's second major error that he made that we see in the story was that he, secondly, never saw beyond himself. I'm reminded of the founder of Meth uh, Methodism, John Wesley. He once said, at Oxford, I had an income in the early years of 30 pounds a year. He lived, he said, I lived on 28 and I gave two away. Then later, my income went up to 60, 90, 120 pounds a year. But I still lived on 28 pounds a year and gave the rest away. My friends, I also see in the story Jesus asking us, in what ways are you seeing beyond your own needs, seeing beyond yourself? What are you doing with your resources to care for others? In this passage, Jesus calls his disciples to take drastic action with their, with our financial resources and personal possessions. We are not to grasp them and hold on to them and trust them. We are rather to use them by investing them internally. Eternally. In fact, the only way we can truly protect our treasure is to invest them in heaven. Our hearts follow our treasure. And if our treasure is in heaven, so will our hearts be too. What Jesus is teaching here is that the crucial issue in, issue in life is not the amount of our treasure, but the location of of it. The rich man's treasures were on earth. He was a fool because he built his life around what does not last, what doesn't really matter. The disciples' call, our call, is to be rich towards God instead with a treasure in heaven that will never be exhausted. Amen. God bless you. Uh, enjoy studying this parable by yourself or with your friends and have a great week. God bless you. Thank you, Paul, for that inspiring message. Hey, guys, as we're about to close our service, I would just like to say that uh, our office will remain available over the summer, but please be aware that most of our staff are also taking some uh, well-deserved time off, taking a little break, so our response time might not be uh, what you're expected from us. 
but we are available. If you'd like to contact our office, we are here. Uh, secondly, if you'd like to receive prayer, if uh, you've been stirred by this message, if you'd like to pray with someone about anything that has come up, we are available for you in our online prayer corner from 11 to 11.30. So just feel free to join that call in via Zoom, and there's a team there waiting for you and ready to pray with you and pray for your needs. Then I would like to say the prayer of blessing together as we are accustomed to. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Enjoy the holidays. Enjoy, hopefully, the good weather and hope to see you soon. Have a blessed week.